Right, um, it's five past, so we'll start now. Um, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Neil Lawrence, who is Professor of Machine Learning in the department. Um, and I am not going to do any sort of long introduction. I'm just going to say that his topic today is actually, in a sense, a meta topic. It's about investigating conference reviewing for one of the main, or the main, uh, machine learning conference, which um, I think everyone would say was an extremely brave experiment uh, that he did in, with others in 2014. So um, very much looking forward to hearing about that. And I'll let Neil take it away now. Thanks, Anne. Uh, so as Anne mentioned, uh, I'm going to talk today about the Europe's experiment. Um, and uh, I'll try and give some background on Europe's and, uh, and the experiment at the start. But uh, uh, what I was keen to do today, it's, it's sort of seven years old. Um, and uh, what I was interested in doing was trying to revisit it and having a look at uh, uh, what we can conclude if we look at what the impact of the papers that was published as over the last sort of seven years. But I'll start by sort of reviewing the main um, uh, experiment. Now, do feel free to sort of drop. Uh, I'm sort of aware that I'm quite familiar with the conference and the experiment, and I'm sure I'm going to forget to say certain things that will make it confusing when I don't say them. So do please feel free to drop stuff in the chat. I've got the chat open. I can keep an eye on the chat to make sure I'm seeing things. And if you ask for any clarifications, I'll sort of give them as I go. And we'll do questions at the end, just because I think if we do questions early, well, it might be that if you're interested that we, we spend too much time on questions and don't get through the whole material. I'm not sure, not given the talk before. Okay, so just by way of introduction, as Anne said, uh, uh, Europe's is um, probably the leading machine learning conference. And uh, uh, as a result now, it's like one of the leading AI conferences because now machine learning seems to be AI. And it has been, I guess, the premier conference in my community since I was a PhD student. So that would be uh, over sort of 20 years. Um, and just to give you a sense of the scale of this conference, it was a record year when it's been a record year every year since, um, a record year then. It was big enough that um, we broke CMT, which was CMT version one, which is a conference management toolkit from Microsoft. Basically, loads of features didn't work. And I had to do a lot of on the fly coding to do things like uh, paper allocation. And uh, there's code online that, that shows how I did that because the, the intrinsic system just didn't fail at this scale. And uh, now they're, size of the conference is about four times as big as this. Um, but we basically had to review papers. We had to um, get together uh, 1,400 reviewers. Um, and we had to um, uh, have 92 area chairs, which was up from sort of 67 uh, the year before. And there were two program chairs, myself and Karina Cortez. And I should say it was Karina Cortez was the first person when we talked about, should we innovate anything this year? She said, well, it would be cool to do an experiment. And I love the idea. Um, and I'll try and explain why I love the idea as I go through, because I think it's sort of incredibly important to understand uh, the, this aspect of conferences. So uh, in terms of submissions, we had nearly 1700 paper submissions and uh, that converted to 400 odd accepted papers. So that's acceptance rate of about 25%. Um, but one of the things I should emphasize, so I used to be associate editor in chief for TPAMI and with Max Welling handled all the machine learning uh, submissions. We were rejecting, desk rejecting 50% because they just were clearly not good enough without going to reviewers. I think if you try and um, desk reject uh, NeurIPS, I mean, they did try the idea, there were a lot of complaints. Um, I, I don't see the current quality of submissions, but the quality of submissions uh, when we were chairing was such that, I mean, we rejected 19 papers without review. So that's like just over 1% or something. Um, and that, uh, if you look at the all papers, it was very hard to pick out papers that were obviously bad without starting to go into them. So it's very, very high quality submissions overall. Um, so what was the experiment? Well, we were interested in how consistent is the process of peer review. So what would happen if you independently reran the conference? Um, now, why was I so enthusiastic about it? Well, because I'd area chaired and program chaired conferences. 
And I think it just opens your eyes when you do that and you realize uh, how difficult it is to decide. And to me, it was obvious that our decisions were to some large extent stochastic. And uh, it felt when I was a PhD student and papers were getting rejected, it, it, it didn't feel like that. It felt like, well, this is deterministic. My paper's rejected because it's, it's not good. And, uh, you know, it's quite discouraging. But the truth is, uh, as, as we'll see, a lot of very good papers get rejected. And, and I think that it's not clear to me that you can sort of say that there's a quality, um, a uh, sort of quantitative reason why that is so. And I think that that's really what the experiment shows. Now, one of the things I sort of uh, will talk about in a bit is, is what people's reaction to the experiment was and, and versus what I thought it might be. But just to sort of explain the style of the experiment, what we did is we selected 10% of all submitted papers. So that's about 170 papers to be reviewed twice independently. And what we did is we split at random the entire reviewing body into two groups. So uh, these papers saw a program committee that was half the size and a reviewing committee that was half the size. We, we allocated reviewers at random between the two groups. But area chairs we selected uh, to go into the two groups because we wanted to, because the problem is if you've only got two area chairs who are expert in say theoretical machine learning, then you want at least one of them in, in each of the groups. So we didn't do, do them randomly. Um, also area chairs uh, could see that, that a particular paper was in the experiment um, because uh, worked out this great trick for how to do the experiment. Basically what we did was we added to those papers that had been selected a new dummy author uh, called like NIPS1 and another called NIPS2. And then we conflicted half the papers with the NIPS1 and half the papers with NIPS2. So you basically by adding that to the conflict system, that's what split the papers across the entire conference. But of course, area chairs could see where we'd done that. So they were aware, but they were told to review as if it was not a duplicated paper, just to review as normal. But of course, we can't be certain that they that they necessarily did. Um, and that also broke CMT, by the way, having an uh, uh, author in that was conflicted with half the conference. So in terms of timeline, uh, the thing about compute, many computer science conferences is, is that the timeline for this sort of reviewing is relatively rapid. And I, I think this is good and bad. I mean, compared to sort of conferences uh, and journals, you know, it, it's a very different setup where fields which are more dominated by journals. But of course, it does mean you can do an experiment like this. So the submission deadline that year was 6th of June. So it was about this time of year that this is all going on. It's still going on now for this year's Neurips. And there were these several stages. So this, this took three weeks to actually have people bid and allocate papers to people, particularly with all those problems with the, the CMT system collapsing. Three weeks for review. So um, that's maybe shorter than you're given typically by a journal. Two weeks for discussion. So this is um, before you actually send the reviews back to the authors. So two weeks for discussion of those initial reviewers and a week for authors to read and uh, reply to the reviews and submit their rebuttal. Another further two weeks, this is discussion between the area chairs and the reviewers. This is a discussion between the area chairs and the reviewers. And then we, uh, in those days, I presume they can't do this today, but um, Karina and I um, individually chaired teleconferences with different groups of area chairs where we discussed the papers and, and ranked them and made final decisions. And then actually my favorite bit was, I, I suggested we have this week, one week of cooling off. After we made the final decisions, we had a one week where we basically sat on the conference and I, I just looked through the decisions, Karina did the same, and we did, just in case anything came up, any urgent things, and then, and then sent out decisions 9th of September. So basically three months overall. Um, and so you'll see some of these periods coming up in some of the results I show. And then just a little bit of more context, how the, the main scoring in Europe that year was a, a 10 point uh, score. Uh, I think it's different nowadays, but we just we, we did very few innovations other than the experiment. We thought the experiment was big enough. So we just kept everything as the previous chairs had. And they were Zubin Garamani and Max Welling from the previous year. And this was their scoring system. So this is the guidance reviewers had that 10 was top 5% of uh, a seminal paper for the ages. There you go. So I will not consider I will consider not reviewing for Neurips again if this is rejected. So uh, they've all got these little statements like that. Nine, top 15%, 10, 
eight top 50 percent so these are very high scores and and people are very happy i mean i don't think i've ever had a 10 um i'm not sure i've ever had a nine eight is already pretty good um seven good paper except um seven people are pretty happy if you're averaging around seven that then they're pretty confident um but it's i vote for acceptance although would not be upset if it were rejected six marginally above the acceptance threshold i tend to vote for accepting it but leaving it out of the program would be no great loss five marginally below four okay not good enough for rejection i would not be upset if it was accepted so actually you get a lot of papers in this scoring from four to seven um, at the conference and uh, then three a clear rejection two a strong rejection it's quite rare to see two i will fight rejection i think there's maybe one or two ones across the whole conference I, I, that is i will consider not reviewing for europe's again if this is accepted <laughs> but i mean ones and tens they're like like hen's teeth they don't come up very much now that's the quantitative score but then people are asked to back up their reviews with a qualitative evaluation and and it's interesting because if you look at the sort of things, if you look at the text, the text is online. You can also read um, more about the reviewing process. You can see what the instructions to reviewers were. Uh, when you start looking at what people are asking people to measure by, you've got these sort of notions like quality, clarity, originality, and significance. And a theme we'll see is it's actually not clear to me to what extent all of these are um, objective or subjective criteria. I mean, significance is, is actually, clearly that seems to be very subjective. Originality is very subjective. Um, quality, maybe is, if that's more about the rigor, then that's maybe more objective. But, but just as a hint for what's gonna come up, a lot of this is very subjective in terms of individuals will have different opinions. Um, and I think that that's key to the underlying stochasticity. So we did a little sort of, there was a website called, a website called SciCast that no longer exists. So unfortunately we can't see the results to this anymore, but this, I do have this screenshot I grabbed at the time. We asked people how consistent, oh sorry, how inconsistent would they think the conference is? Um, that was the measure that was in my head at the time, the inconsistency of the conference. Um, and inconsistency meaning that if you run it again, what percentage of decisions would be different? Now, actually, people grabbed onto different figures once we published the results, and we'll come back to those. But this was the one that was in, certainly in my head at the time. And what you see is that people think it's going to be about 30% inconsistent. Okay, some people are making quite odd forecasts because 70% inconsistent would mean we're actively messing up decisions across the two committees. So that's quite unlikely. You, you know, 50% would should be the uh, lowest. That would be the random committee. Uh, well, not even that because it separates different. So some people are sort of thinking more, but the average is around 30%. And what, what the actual figure we got was 25%. So it comes in around about here. So that's 25% inconsistency. So 25% of decisions varied across the committees. But to try and put that into um, a bit of context, this is, I think this is a nicer way. This is probably what we should have been thinking about and what we steered towards in the discussion. This is a sort of, um, uh, it's like a confusion matrix between the two um, committees. So um, there's a sort of uh, 160 odd uh, papers here, 100 of, and what we see is that two committees were consistent about 22 of the accepts, they were consistent about 101 of the rejects, and they were inconsistent about, in both cases, 21 of the rejects on this side, 22 of the rejects on this side. Now, what that means is, and this is the figure that everyone sort of went with, is that if you viewed, say, the, the conference from this committee's, Committee 2's perspective, it's got 44 accepts and 123 rejects, right? And, but of those 44 accepts, only 22 will also be viewed, if you viewed it from sort of looking down the, the committee one perspective, only 22 are the same. So the headline figure people like to talk about is that 50% of the papers you see at the conference would not be there with an independent rewriting, which is, I suppose, quite a large figure. People freaked out about that. Um, I, I don't find it personally that surprising, but people were genuinely sort of like quite shocked. So you're, you're at the conference, you're looking at papers and half the papers you're seeing, if you re-ran that conference, 
uh, would not be there. They'd be replaced by another half. And I think what was very interesting about the reaction um, is that people sort of were really keen to fix this. I mean, there were various things were done. There was lots of conversation about how, how this should be fixed. And people did things like, oh, we should have six reviewers per paper, you know, and, and, and this is a sort of very bad thing. Now, my feeling is that it's just a fact of life. I, I didn't know to what extent it was a fact of life, but uh, I'd seen that these decisions were likely to be stochastic. Our acceptances are constrained by the size of the venue. So we were constrained to a maximum of 420 papers that year. Um, we actually accepted 414, and that's just around individual decisions. You're not working to that number exactly. Um, but we were constrained to 420, so that it's a very arbitrary number that we're, we're accepting you know, about 25%, just because of the constraints of the venue. So to me, it's utterly unsurprising that it's quite hard to make those decisions. And you know, we'll, we'll hopefully have time at the end for you can offer your opinion about whether that's surprising or, or good or bad. But um, yeah, so there's some links for what, unfortunately, as I say, the public reaction. Uh, yeah, so you can see blog posts and various people saying various things. Um, we never actually formally published the experiment, uh, which is, yeah, I mean, it's a mistake. I mean, it's probably a mistake, but we're just so exhausted after running a conference this side. I, I did draft something. Maybe we'll publish something now. But to just try and put that in context, imagine we had just had a random committee. So we've seen that that inconsistency. So let's just think of what a random committee would be that's accepting at 25%, which is roughly our accept rate for that year. What you see is that you're going to have much greater inconsistency because you're going to have accepting 10 papers are going to be accepted by both committees whereas 31 papers are gonna be accepted by one by rejected by another. So just to sort of give those figures, let's flip between those figures, you're seeing those figures changing now. So we are clearly doing better, which is good, isn't it? We're doing better than a purely random committee. Um, and actually you'll see in the notes, I did quite a lot of analysis. We are statistically significantly a lot better than a random committee. Um, so there is some sort of consistency going on, but you know, actually the figures, when you look at them, uh, the inconsistency isn't going um, up as much as you might hope, because here you're seeing this conference is effectively 75% different. Um, so if we think of that as something like the accept precision, how precise is the conference about accepting? Well, it's gone from 50% accept precision to 75. So, um, sorry, 25% to 25, not 75, to 25% accept precision. So in some sense, like, yeah, uh, is the conference really that much higher quality with the non-random? I don't know, right. Well, well, well let's, let's dive a little bit deeper into that. So one of the things um, I didn't, haven't talked about in the past, this is new for 2021, but started thinking a bit about um, in preparation for this talk is uh, something else that, I, that we ran. And other people have built models like this to calibrate reviewers. And I think that there's a really, it turns out there's an interesting connection between this reviewer calibration model and the experiment itself. So reviewer calibration, and uh, there's, I'm gonna get some sites up on, uh, some references up on the notes because I was talking to Robert Mackay, who's worked on a reviewer calibration model 2017. Zubin Garamani, Max Welling had one, um, John Platt, Chris Burgess built one. They're not that widely published. So when it came to doing one, I kind of just wrote one from scratch. And, and this, is the, this is what I did. So the reviewer calibration says, well, the, the reviewer score that we're going to get, YIJ, is going to be a function of three different things. And, and you can make it more complex than this. There's definitely one weakness in this model that I would fix if, if I had time, but th this is what I did at the time. Um, and it says that there's one thing is a sort of a paper specific. So I is the index over papers. So this is reviewer um, J reviewing paper I, yeah? So this is a sparse matrix because not everyone reviews all papers. So it says, well, there's gonna be something that is associated with some shared quality for the paper. So some shared, so this is the quality of the paper that we're gonna see. And so that's indexed per paper, FI. And then different reviewers will interpret that scale we saw earlier differently. So some people have a different idea of what a good and bad paper is. So every reviewer brings their own bias. So in the early days of Europe, this used to be called the hard ass factor. So how much is the reviewer a sort of 
crueler reviewer versus a more positive reviewer. So that's specific. And so we want to throw this term away. This is a term we don't like because it's just like how someone's interpreting the scale. And then the, finally, we have a term that is um, a sort of a noise term in effect. It's sort of like, well, there's gonna be some variation an independent assessment of the reviewers, right? So epsilon, and we quite use, often use epsilon for noise. Epsilon is independently sampled for each yij, okay? Now that model, um, what we're gonna do here is, and it, it's not actually such a strong assumption because you can obviously rescale these things. So I don't think this is too bad an assumption, is just to assume that these each of these terms is Gaussian distributed. And, um, I mean, definitely, there's different things you can do, but if you want to do this fast, this is an assumption you can make that, uh, that the sort of that the paper quality is sampled from a Gaussian with a variance of alpha f. The uh, reviewer bias is sampled from um, a, a Gaussian with a variance alpha b. And the, um, this, this other term, uh, the noise term, is sampled from a Gaussian with variance sigma squared. Now, if you do that, this model is analytic. It's analytically tractable. It turns out to be a sort of a, a large, what you get is a large sparse Gaussian covariance for your system. And you can fit these parameters and they're very well determined at this scale of reviews. So we fit those parameters by a maximum likelihood. And then we use those parameters to um, remove the bias effect from the reviews. Um, sorry, that should be sigma squared, not sigma two. And it's the, the actual underlying model is a joint Gaussian over the data. Now, this is important because this is how the parameters come out from the Europe's 2014. And as I say, these are very well determined given the number of views you have, right? So what it's saying here is the variation in scores. So you can, you can see this, the nice thing about the Gaussians, you can just see this as a decomposition of the scores, right? So um, you can sort of see it as the percentage variance, a bit like sort of PCA when we do eigenvalues there. So 1.28 of the variance is associated with the paper quality, that's good. Uh, 0.24 is associated with reviewer reinterpreting the score. So it's quite a lot less, so the movement uh, left and right. Um, this is variance, it's not standard deviations. So you have to square root that to get the standard deviation. Uh, is uh, quite a lot smaller than the quality signal on the paper. But then interestingly, sigma squared, which is in inverted commas, the noise, the noise is just as large as the underlying quality. So each paper when it's being assessed, the score we're seeing, once we remove this, because we manage, we can remove that mathematically, we're left with a score that is 50%, this is what all the reviewers are saying about this paper, and 50% what three reviewers are saying independently about the paper. Now, this is really important. Um, and I don't, initially when I set this system up, um, I, I wanted to throw the noise term away. But if you think about, throwing a noise term away. I actually started referring to this as different things. I don't refer to this as noise. I refer to this as objective quality and this as subjective quality. And why do I do that? Well, if you look at those different criteria we suggested, what you saw was they are very subjective. And uh, I haven't gone through this, but it, it's in sort of online. One of the things we did is we were very careful to make sure every single paper had at least one expert reviewer in terms of someone who published at Europe's many times. One of the problems with the growing conference is the reviewing body is constantly refreshing with lots of PhD students. So what we did is made sure every paper, rather than randomly allocating, because uh, I coded the allocation system myself, I was able to allocate every paper first with an expert reviewer, every paper then with, you know, the slightly less expert and make sure that, that there was no paper with two reviewers who had only published at once at Europe's before. So actually these people have different experiences and they have different opinions and they say different things. So it's not surprising that there's a significant um, sort of independent component. That's why I, I, I tend to refer to it as the subjective variance. But notice the score we're seeing is about 50% objective and 50% subjective. And the great thing about this is you can fit this model to your data without doing the Europe's experiment, right? You don't, you can check your, this is a simple model. I've got code online for how you do it. 
any reviewing, you can submit fit this model. You, you have to have, you know, if it's a small group of reviewers, these parameters won't be very well determined. But even for quite a small conference, the parameters become quite well determined. Um, I'm going to skip that. And just to say, well, this is the effect of what happened to the original review scores as you remove the bias. So this is the original review score, which is a sort of integer. And then as you remove the bias, what you see is like people, are they're not going up more than one uh, level. It just sort of pushes them up or down one. So, you know, what you're trying to deal with is these sort of papers here where, well, one is overly positive and another is overly negative or something like that, you know, and it resolves all that for you. And lots of Monte Carlo sampling from the system to get a good ranking of the conference, which, which I think was a system that worked pretty well. Um, what we can do is we can also look then at the correlation between the scores from different um, reviewers. So, so I should have introduced that a little bit better. So that's the calibration. I'm going to sort of change a little bit after doing the calibration to just say, is it working? And what we're going to do is look at the correlation between the two committees for those papers that were um, selected for duplication. And so we've already looked at this in one sense. The, we've looked at the, the, um, the consistency uh, and, the incons and the accept precision. But here we're just looking at this, what's the correlation between reviewer scores? And of course, I, I could access this um, during the conference as reviews were coming in. So this is something I was just out of interest looking at over time as the reviews came in. And what we see is that there is a correlation and it's about 50%. Now that's not surprising given the calibration we've just seen. If the signal you're seeing is 50% signal and 50% noise, then you're not going to get more than 50% correlation. So in fact, this is consistent with what the calibration model says, that we're looking at correlation of about 50%. There is correlation, but obviously there's a lot of stuff off the, um, off the diagonal line. So that's the correlation um, of the raw scores. And the correlation slightly improves if we use the um, calibrated scores, not by a great deal, but it improves slightly. So that's also the calibration is not killing things. So the calibration is something we use in practice. But once you've observed that, you might sort of say, well, now I can simulate the conference because now I have a sense of um, what's going on in the conference. What I'm seeing is a bunch of papers where on average, 50% of the score I'm seeing is, is paper specific and 50% of the score is subjective coming from the experience of the reviewer. Um, and we've seen that that's what the calibration says and that that's what the duplication says is going on. So we can now simulate a conference just by sampling some random variables and study the statistics of that. And that's what I want to do next to sort of try and highlight how hard it is to get very consistent conferences. So um, if that is what's fundamentally going on, that you're seeing 50% is inconsistent and 50% is um, uh, consistent across 50% is subjective and 50% is objective, then this is, this is what happens to that um, uh, level of um, consistency. So in fact, I've got consistencies here. Sorry, it should be the accept precision on this axis. So we were around about here. If you simulate that conference, right? We're at about 50% accept precision, which is this point here, 25% accept rate. But the main driver of what that accept precision is, is actually just the accept rate itself, because this is the random committee, right? So you get 25% accept precision on the random committee. Of course, if you accept all papers, you're 100% consistent. So the main driver of that function is actually just your accept rate. Certainly, if you if that's your consistency, obviously, if people are your sorry, um, if 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 your if it's fifty percent subjective, fifty percent objective. Obviously, if it was one hundred percent objective, then you would have one hundred percent consistent conference. But given what we're seeing in terms of how people are scoring, it's not surprising. Um, now, what I then sort of thought, okay, that's interesting. So let me just plot what I call the consistency gap. So the gap between the random committee, this is white lines, the random committee, and what we're actually seeing in terms of accept precision. And what we see is that, that that gap is largest below 20%. It's largest here, right? So we're operating at this point here. 
And as you increase the accept rate, that gap reduces. So I don't know. I don't even know if this is a sensible measure, but somehow it feels like this is a measure that shows how much value you're adding through the reviewing process. So actually, it turns out that if a lot of conferences accept in this region here, and it turns out if you like this measure, which I'm not sure I do, it turns out that you are maximizing the sort of gain over the average conference if the reviewers are 50 percent objective, 50 percent subjective. OK. So what I all of that's all very well um, and you could do all that before the conference. But what I wanted to do for this one is make the sort of following point. If reviewers are accurate in selecting papers that have high impact over time. You want them to be highly consistent. But if they're making errors, if reviewers aren't very good at identifying papers that are gonna be high impact, then you actually want this type of inconsistency that um, we're talking about. Because, so let me try and put it this way. This is something I think about a lot in terms of uh, machine decision-making. If you accept you're going to make errors, it's better to make errors inconsistently than to make consistent errors. That, that's, my, that's my perspective. Um, and I think that this, this inconsistency that's coming in is very, very important in ensuring we're exploring that space. So the question is, are we making errors? And I thought that now, seven years on, is a wonderful chance to go through. Um, what data did I keep? Well, I, I kept the ID and title and uh, primary contact author of those um, rejected papers. So I don't have the paper itself, and I don't think I even got its abstract. But what I can do, and this took me a long time, I searched 1,200 rejected papers, or however many rejected papers there was here, 12, 1,290 1, odd rejected papers, and I looked for them online to see if they were published anywhere else. So that was quite a big task, and um, maybe why I've not been that responsible email recently. So what we're seeing here is this is the number submitted to the conference in the base case. This is the number that were accepted as posters, 332. So that's 1,700 odd, 330 accepted as posters, 62 as spotlights, and it used to be single track. So there are only time for 20 or all. And then up here, we have the 1,300 papers that were rejected. Now, out of those 1,300, so I put dev null, I, the ones I couldn't find a trace of, 584, disappear without a trace. Another 177 only seem to exist on archive, so they don't seem to have been published anywhere, but they were put on archive around the time of the conference and they're still left there. Uh, another 76 seem to exist, but not on archive, sort of they're not published, but they're on a web page or something like that. So look, you've got about 240, 250 odd papers that are um, not published, but available. Now then, what happens to the papers that actually gets published? Well, this is in order of, of, of where we see them appearing. And, and most of these are the year after, but some are, you know, some will be a couple of years after. What we see is that 72 appeared in AAAI, 57 in AI stats, 33 in ICML, 17 in CVPR, that's a vision conference. These are core machine learning conferences. Triple AI is an AI conference that is now dominated by machine learning, but I don't think I've ever submitted to Triple AI or reviewed for them, but a lot of people do. But these are core ML conferences. This is a vision conference. Um, 15 appear at Future in Europe, so they go around again and they reappear. 14 JMLR, which is to me the key, the, the leading journal in the field. Um, HKI International Joint Conference on Artificial Intelligence 14, so on and so forth. Uh, you can see some, unfortunately, the, the font, I couldn't get the color right on the font, but uh, you can see them here, neural computation, um, so on and so forth, down to, uh, this is transactions on information technology. There's a bunch of IEEE journals starting to appear uh, down here, but, and I've, I've dropped everything that had under, under three um, rejected Europe's papers and put them all here into others. So there's 117 others, this sort of long tail of papers that were published in different venues, um, but uh, are not in Europe. So that's kind of interesting because it, it, these are pretty high quality venues. I mean, I wouldn't personally, you know, people like to have these rankings, but to me, this is all much of a muchness, certainly up to um, JMLR, yeah, and, you know, ICLR is well known, UAI, all, all these top, I, you know, I, I wouldn't, wouldn't bother distinguishing. Um, 
Okay, so that's where the papers go. Um, but what was their impact? Well, I've taken out, I've done a few things on this plot because I don't really want to inadvertently reveal the underlying scores. I mean, seven years ago, I'm not sure people would mind that much, but I've uh, done a couple of things here. I'm not showing you the axes. And I've also added um, Laplacian noise to give some sort of differential privacy to um, these values. Um, but what I'm showing is a plot that is giving you the average calibrated quality as by the calibration system I showed against the, okay, so let's talk a little bit about this. This is the base 10 logarithm of one plus the total citations that paper received. Why one plus? Well, some papers receive no citations, so I don't want a sort of log of zero, but also I kind of feel, you know, the paper wrote about itself. So that's like a, a base citation. So that's my argument why it's okay. Um, and if I, if I take away the log, it's, um, I mean, to give you a sense, this is, we're in the 10 to the fours up here, right? So if I take away the log, you, you get these things will really dominate the correlation, the, these things up here. So putting the log in, and if I look at this, and the reason I wanted to show you this, yes, this looks broadly Gaussian-ish. So I feel happy just losing standard correlation to measure what's going on here. And it looks pretty good. This is the average calibrated quality against the number of citations. And we see that there's, a, there's quite a strong correlation. But I should add that the, the pink dots are accepted papers. The yellow crosses are rejected papers that did not get published. So they're either in, so the yellow crosses are coming from these two here. Those are the yellow crosses. The pink crosses are everything that's in here. Yeah, so this is yellow crosses, this is pink crosses, and uh, this is uh, pink dots. Um, and so, yeah, so it seems a bit odd to, you know, there's probably a boost effect by having your paper in Europe anyway, particularly these, these must all have been published before all of these, right? So let's look instead at the correlation within group. There's something called Simpson's paradox that many of you may know about uh, that says you should not do this. You should not look at correlations um, by including different groups there. So this is the correlation for accepted Europe's papers between the average calibrated quality as scored by those reviewers, the thing that we've been talking about a lot, against the impact those papers have had. And what we see is there's none, pretty much. Basically, the calibration, I mean, this, this looks, you know, it says 0.051, right? So which is minimal. Um, and you, you see it yourself. Again, I've, I've differentially privatized the, um, the uh, dots, um, but you see it yourself that uh, there's, there's just no correlation there, really. We, we can't say anything about the average calibrated quality of the accepted papers against the long number of citations. That feels pretty depressing for all that work, doesn't it? Now, having said that, if you do look at the um, rejected papers on their own, and, and actually, again, if you, 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 you can see here, the yellow, as I say, is the archive, the pink is the published, not on archive. Uh, well, they could have been published archive, but uh, they are published elsewhere as well. Uh, what you do see is that there is a calibration. There is a, a correlation between the um, average accepted the calibrated quality and the impact of the papers. So this, when, we, when we're looking here, we're down in the sort of average scores of around about three, right? This decision boundary is, is occurring around about six, right? So um, coming back to this, this is around about six, yeah? But, but do look in this region. I mean, I find it an absurdity that people think that they can find a decision boundary along here that says, oh, this is a definite accept and a definite reject. Look at the, even the archive papers, the things that haven't been published anywhere else, they're kind of indistinguishable to the first pass from the papers that were accepted. Of course, they could have been improved. They could have been improved, certainly the published papers. And indeed, some of the titles have changed. Uh, so, you know, they, they're modified as well. Um, but yeah, you know, you can see that, yes, it does seem that the low level Europe's reviewers are capable of picking out a bad paper. So what it seems to me, if we accept citations, which is, you know, there's arguments against that, 
as, as a good measure of the quality of a paper, uh, certainly its impact, what we see is that um, uh, New York's reviewers are okay, they're good at picking out bad papers. They're not good at picking out good papers. They don't really have, you know, this, these, these things here are seminal papers, seminal papers, that's what it said. Right, but, but actually the seminal papers seem to be here in the middle, right? Okay, um, so, so the last couple of things to look at on there. So is, is there a correlation with anything else? So well that Zubin and Max had introduced um, an impact score, where they said specifically score two, if you think this is going to be an impactful paper, one if it's just run of the mill. And so that impact score, there's, there's some small amount of correlation. So that, that's a little bit nicer, isn't it? As, as you might hope, it does seem that when reviewers are asked to score for impact, then they do do a better job. Um, but interestingly, and you know, I haven't put too much in-depth analysis into this, but I thought this was fun. There's an even better correlation with the confidence, the average confidence of the reviewers. So reviewers are asked to score with a confidence. And what we see is that the strongest correlation of all is that papers uh, where reviewers were confident have high impact. Now, I think this is quite interesting because it's sort of Part of the confidence is the expertise of the individual reviewer, but presumably part of the confidence is the clarity of the paper or the simplicity of the idea, how easy it was to understand or the elegance of the exposition. And so it's clearly not that the confidence is, is directly affecting the impact, but it feels like there's a latent variable here that we're not measuring when we measure the quality of these papers, which is something like a roundabout. Uh, how clear is this paper? Potentially, you know, I'm not proving this. This is exploratory data analysis. So I like that thought. So I, I want to sort of make sure we've got plenty of time for questions. So you can see there's a couple of uh, uh, slides I skipped. Um, but uh, my argument is, I mean, so part of what I'm showing you is rigorously statistically done, and part of it is just subjective things that I think. I've always felt and was keen to do the experiment that because I knew that to a large extent that there was stochasticity or what I think I would prefer to refer to as subjectivity in the decision process, which emerges and appears as stochasticity. And I would like to argue that that is a good thing. Um, the worst would be like, we could easily make the decision consistent. We can just accept all papers from people whose surname starts with A. Consistency is not correctness. And once you have demonstrated that uh, people are not actually that great at scoring great papers, um, you're better off having a somewhat inconsistent process. So at least some of those uh, papers which people aren't spotting are getting through than a totally consistent process. Now, uh, that's something I kind of firmly believe. I'm not sure how coherently I've, I've, I've argued that, um, but uh, you know we can discuss that in questions. But a sort of follow-up point, what use do I think of, of conferences like Europe? Some, you know, I've, I've been on the board for a number of years. I've been program chair, I've been general chair, I've been every type of chair going. And, you know, it's a community and a, and a project I believe in. But um, I really think we overstate the importance of it when we're evaluating people. Um, people are getting jobs on the back of Neurot's papers. They get tenure on the back of Neurot's papers. And it is clearly not a sufficient thing that you've got a Neurot's paper or that you don't have one to decide, to dominate a decision like this. Um, what do I do think, what are they useful for? Well, uh, in Sheffield, there was the Millennium Galleries uh, near the Winter Gardens, and that used to have a wonderful exhibition. I can't remember if it was permanent or temporary, which was all the knives, because Sheffield's famous for knives, um, that apprentices had made to demonstrate the end of their apprenticeship. And what that was showing is that they could do all these difficult metal skills. So, you know, doing silver plate and all these sort of things. And, and what you got was some very beautiful, but very impractical knives, because of course, you don't always have a demand for this technical skill set. And I think the way I look at Europe is, is it's that. It's a, it's, a, it's a gallery of impractical knives. Most of the stuff that's there is technically highly skilled. It's great that people can do it. Super interesting that they've managed to do it, but it's just showing that they've got this capability. So it's like the end exam of an apprenticeship. And that's what reviewers seem to be scoring for because they're not scoring for the impact, the practical quality of the knife in general. That's my supposition. Um, and uh, I've tried to be provocative. So hopefully there's a bit of time uh, for questions. Stop sharing. I can look at the Q&A as well. Shall I read? Oh, shall I just?
Well, I mean, I'll tell you what, I'll, why don't I ask a question first? And that gives people time to type more things into the Q&A because we've got yeah. good points coming in, but I think we could do with a, bit, a little bit more time. So I'm going to just, I'm going to, well, it's partly a comment and partly a question. It's something, the acceptance rate at conferences and workshops and so on, hugely different between subject areas, actually, even within computer science. So my own area, computational linguistics, roughly speaking, 20% acceptance rate at the conferences. Um, actually, speech, I don't know the rate nowadays, but at one point, you know, even when computational linguistics was 20%, speech, which you'd have thought was a pretty similar field, the main speech conference was 70% acceptance. Mathematicians seem to hate rejecting any papers. So when I was on a program uh, committee with a mathematician, it was like, you know, the thing had to be absolutely stinking before they would consider rejecting it. So this is this is very interesting. And it seems that this has just sort of evolved. And I mean, I do wonder whether, um, I, I mean, I want to point out, by the way, that sort of really, you know, taking Neurip's papers or any other publication as the sort of determining thing for jobs We've signed up to Dora, which should make that, you know, uh, actually, we should be very, very careful about uh, um, about any such thing. But, um, yeah, I wonder whether we should actually be really rejecting things just on the basis that they're stinking awful and um, having closer to accept all conferences because we can now because, you know, it's not going to be in person. It came up for ICML and there was a bit of a Twitter debate about it with myself and several other people who, many of whom I've mentioned, I think, uh, Max Welling, I think was one, UYT, saying that because the ICML chairs were told to squeeze their acceptances down to 25%, to which some area chairs complained, saying we've got no need to do this. We should just accept what's good. And um, there was a little bit of a debate. And I think that they, my, my understanding is that they did squeeze it. And I think it's all associated with, I think the, the US tenure track process has a lot to answer for. And I think one problem we have is that um, somehow in Europe's papers are considered uh, evidence for tenure. The Americans spent a lot of time trying to make that the case. And I think we're all burdened with that being the case. Um, and that means that because they want to make these arguments that these other lists like the core list, which says things like it will have a high reject rate to be a prestigious conference and people measure things on that, that people are pushing for a low accept rate for prestige. To me, that misses the entire point of a conference. And I think that the conferences and machine learning are getting more and more boring as a result of it. And I tend to prefer workshops. Uh, I do think that there's another practical thing is that there's this, it's an entity now. It's almost like institutionally it's an entity and, and should we mess with it? So I almost think, okay, that's there. This is how you do that thing. Um, but, but it's it's something that you have to do on the side rather than the thing that should be dominating your view of what your research is. It's something like, oh, well, that would work for Neurips. It shouldn't be that we're going to set out to submit to Neurips. It's just like, oh, I think that would work if we explained it in that way. But it does sort of lead to the question, well, where do you output these things? And I think, you know, it's very interesting, like doing the ref reviewing at the moment, you see all these different communities and the different things they do and then have to spend a lot of time thinking about that. I mean, I think this stuff's fascinating and we could go on for ages about it and also talk about, I mean, John's got a couple of comments in the Q and A's or, or questions perhaps uh, about um, the ref and, you know, we could also talk about um, reviewing for funding proposals and so on. Um, have you had a look at the Q and A's, some that you actually particularly want to answer or shall, um, or shall I choose some and ask you? You can choose, yeah, I, I've, I'm, I'm having a look through, but... Uh... Probably best if you choose Anne. So um, there's this um, there's there's sort of comments about how often has this been done? Has this been done with other conferences? Do you know and things? Which I think that's an interesting point. And and should people do this sort of thing again? Should people? Uh, I think it has been. It was repeated at a smaller scale at one conference. I can't remember which. It was definitely talked about in the theoretical computer science community. Sorry, I should have double checked all this. Um, and it's being repeated this year in Europe. Uh, so it will be 
there will be a repeat of it this year. Um, and my guess is that the result is likely to be similar. But I think the interesting insight from the thing I'm saying here is if you build this type of calibration models, it seems to me that it's giving you most of the information you need without doing the experiment. If you're trying to sort of, and, and you know, and I think that this is, I think getting more honest about that that's the way people, that there is some component to a paper that's going to be shared across reviewers and some component that's going to be their subjective opinion. And, and that's okay, you know, that, that's the way it should be. Um, but I think maybe steering people to worry more about it's so interesting. I'm so intrigued by that confidence being correlated with uh, citations because it sort of makes a lot of sense in retrospect. Because as an area chair, one of the things I've struggled with is reviewers who understand the paper very quickly. It's a great idea, but they don't feel that the author sweated enough to produce the paper. And so they want to reject it. And it's super frustrating and it's constant and it's really annoying. And you see it again and again. Um, and there was one paper that, that uh, I was area chair for through, that I forced it through, and it is the second most cited paper on, on that year's Europe's, and the most cited is, is ImageNet, because because people reviewers hate that, but readers love it, and 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 I think that there's a real interesting thing there. But how do you get reviewers to score for that? Because whatever instructions you give them, they don't seem to. Right? Is my experience. Yeah, I mean, I think there's this effect of, oh, yeah, we should have done that. Um, and I'm sure we did do it sometimes. So it's like, oh, I could have done that. Reject. <laughs> do you want to talk about citation as a measure of impact? Because, I mean, there's some comment that citation is an imperfect measure of impact. Yeah, definitely. I mean, and, and you have to, even within the ML community, you know, a thousand citations for a, a deep learning paper is, is not necessarily as impactful as sort of 150 citations for a theory paper. I mean, the theory paper must be astonishing, like if, if it gets 150 citations. And we're also seeing, and you know, this definitely comes up when you're looking at ref, like there's this whole phenomena right now with deep learning of the per first person to do something with a model is um, is the one that's most cited. But of course, if they hadn't done it, if you do a leave one out estimation on them, someone else would have done it two months later. And, you know, it, it's not particularly, so on originality, it doesn't score. I mean, it, it does, I don't know if it scores on significance. This is sort of an interesting question. So definitely citation is is an imperfect measure of impact, but it's, um, you know, but it's there. And, uh, um, you know, the, I could use it. I, I did wonder about trying to, you know, there's so many things you, you could do with this data. It's like subgroup by area and things like that, but it just felt like I didn't have time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's been work in the department, mainly by Simone, um, Simone Teufel, about sort of analyzing citations and seeing what type of citation they are, because sometimes these ritual citations really push up the number of um, number of citations a paper gets, but aren't, it doesn't necessarily show it's sort of hugely significant. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, I should look at some more questions by other people. Um, John has a couple of comments on other... Ex Shadow PCs, yeah. Yeah, junior are more harsh. John's saying that shadow PCs, that it is very often more junior people who are, are quite harsh critics. And, and I think bear that in mind if you're a junior reviewer. Um, and I think it's partially because in, in, in junior reviewers' heads, these are difficult things to get into. So they tend to have this quite high bar. Um, and that, that's one problem with a conference like Europe's is just the number of more junior reviewers you necessarily have. Um, yeah, and, and I, I think that the, the interesting question, John, about changing the CS conference culture, I partially think that this is like tidal, this is systemic, and it's very difficult to, um, I mean, you can, you can improve, but building a sort of tidal wall or a tidal gate to stop it is a lot of effort, and it's not necessarily clear it's going to get exactly the result you want, because perhaps the tide of stuff comes up somewhere else. And, and the other interesting thing is, is the whole archive culture now and what that means for double blind reviewing. Everything's moving so fast. So I just, I kind of tend to have this attitude of like, yeah, just don't take it so seriously. I mean, you know, be excited about things because people you respect are excited about them and you have great workshops talking about them. And that to me, in the, that's kind of something that's always steered me. And in the long term, 
those works turned out to be very impactful. Targeting a conference with something turns out to be not very impactful. Um, exciting colleagues and people in other fields is so. You know, it's easy to say when you're 20 years into a career, but it is kind of it seems to work. <laughs> There's another one here about uh, you say your papers are impractical knives, but isn't this the point of academia to show we can do things? Yeah, and I think absolutely uh, from Edward Yang. You know, I'm not um, I'm not dissing that, but let's bear in mind that that's what we're looking at, and that if you use them, you'll often cut yourself on them because of the weird way that they are designed. And and we shouldn't, you know. And I tell you, that's a beautiful. You know, if you're in Sheffield, go into the Winter Gardens, go go down, look at those. You know, it's extraordinary what people can do. And by the way seeing what other people can do can inspire you to do things that are very practical. So there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with the sort of impractical knives things because it's very skilled work and people are measuring that skilled work. Um, but, uh, but by the same token, let's not mistake that for sort of utility for society. I mean, so I, I had to lead the Sheffield ref thing. And so I, I did get, I did ask myself, well, what does impact mean? And, and I think you have to ask yourself that question. I mean, certainly for me, that feels important and so yes i participate in in the impractical knife show but i actually like to go away and, and do things with practical knives as well i'm a bit conscious of time i've suddenly noticed that it's got to four o'clock and um um this was a, a fascinating a topic um i wonder whether there's any sort of you know closing comment that you that you want to make, but I guess we should be thinking about um, about winding up. If um... yeah, I mean, I guess in closing, um, you know, I think that the the reaction to the experiment was sort of shock horror. Look, our conference reviewing's inconsistent, and let's fix it. Whereas to me, it was like going into the experiment was it's inconsistent, and this is a property of the system. You know, you've asked three people for subjective opinion. What do you expect? Um, even if you are six, it's going to be inconsistent. Uh, and, you know, my hope was that the general reaction was going to be that, yes, conferences are great and practical knives, exciting, but, but a bit more of a shift to what their role is, which is that share of knowledge and understanding and sort of getting together and bouncing ideas off each other. And, and a bit of what Anne was sort of saying about these uh, the ideas that are really cool and really useful. And I, I'm afraid, I think in the last seven years, perhaps because of the context of AI and how important it is, you know, and uh, this being a ticket, like a, a, a Europe's paper is like your, your ticket to a job in, which is paying an inordinate amount of money at some company that just spends all their time playing the neural networks. Um, that unfortunately, perhaps people are taking them more seriously today than they were. And I think it's damaging the overall quality of research particularly for PhD students who, who don't have to rush to get these things out and have time to think about what they want to do and why and uh, come up with a coherent thesis rather than um, the sort of paper that gets into Europe's, which is a highly technical, cool idea that extends stuff from uh, that people have been talking about over the last couple of years. Great. Well, thank you so much. And thank you so much for all the effort you put into actually tracking the papers. That's this is actually extremely helpful, I think, for, um, you know, for many of us in terms of um, discussions of this sort of thing. So um, I think at that point, we should, um, we should probably, we should probably wind up and, um, and thank Neil very much, um, virtually, I guess, but you know, I could clap like this. Thanks very much for the invite um, and uh, thanks for everyone for attending. <laughs>